Good afternoon, Senators. It being 2 p.m., we will resume with questions without notice. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Payne will be absent from question time today, uh, Monday, 23 March 2020, for personal reasons. Uh, in Senator Payne's absence, Senator Birmingham will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Women. Senator Cash will represent the Attorney General and the Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In what is an unprecedented health and economic crisis, Australians need leadership, decisive and early action, and clear, consistent advice from government. What steps is the Prime Minister taking to improve the communication of measures related to the COVID-19 outbreak, including the rules on testing, advice to parents on school closures, and the difference between essential and non-essential activities? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Keneally uh, for that question. Um, Senator Keneally is right. This is uh, an unprecedented a health crisis, and it's an unprecedented health crisis with uh, significant economic implications, and uh, indeed the effects of it are being felt uh, by Australians all around our country as we speak. Um, the, the, the Prime Minister has provided significant uh, national leadership uh, in relation to this, and uh, indeed, as you would be aware, the, the uh, Prime Minister uh, convenes on a regular basis uh, now the national cabinet made up of uh, the Prime Minister and all. Uh, premiers and chief ministers from around Australia, and they uh, have um, made decisions on how best to respond to all of the relevant aspects uh, in uh, responding to this uh, crisis. From a health point of view, the mission is very simple. We want to slow uh, the spread of this virus to save lives. We want to slow the spread of this virus, acknowledging that we cannot um, stop it because we want to ensure that there is a more consistent and more manageable, to, to the extent possible, uh, flow of patients uh, into our health system uh, to ensure uh, that um, our, our most vulnerable uh, Australians can be appropriately prior prioritised. Uh, you know, I think the messages have been very, very clear. The messages have been very, very clear, but uh, you know, in the face of uh, um, some um, apparent reluctance by a sufficient number of Australians to follow uh, the advice and follow the requests in relation to social distancing and the like, the measures have become uh, increasingly uh, more stringent. Uh, as you will be aware, Premiers and Chief Ministers have agreed to implement through state and territory laws new stage one restrictions on social gatherings uh, to be reviewed on a monthly basis. Australians should expect that these measures will be in place for at least uh, six months. Uh, as you'd be aware, uh, as of um, 23 March 2020, pubs, registered and licensed clubs, excluding bottle shops. Order, uh, Senator Cormann. Time has expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Last night, the Prime Minister said schools will be open today in line with medical advice and that parents can now keep their children home from school if they choose to do so. State and territory governments have contradicted the Prime Minister, and there are conflicting reports about whether schools are open or closed. Minister, are schools around Australia open or closed? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I completely reject the premise of the question of any conflict between uh, what uh, the Prime Minister is saying and what state and territory um, uh, premiers and uh, chief ministers are saying. That is just completely and utterly false. Uh, the advice that is available uh, to uh, the federal government and indeed to all state and territory governments is that schools should remain open. Uh, indeed, um, indeed, the safest place for children to be is at school. That is the safest place for them to be, and it's indeed also uh, advisable from a public health point of view. And all of the statements of uh, territory, uh, premiers and territory chief ministers have been consistent with that. Uh, Victoria was. Uh, uh, reaching its end of term later this week, and they have decided to bring that forward by a couple of days, and they are yet 
uh, to uh, make announcements as to what would happen after the um, holiday period based on, based on advice. But if you look at what all of the premiers have said, they've ac accepted that there's a consensus that schools should remain open. We've always accepted that ultimately parents Order. will decide Senator what is best for their children. For the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Workers are already being laid off and businesses are already closing, but the government is delaying support for the households until late April and providing no guarantee that wage supports will flow directly to employees. Why won't the government provide assistance to those who need it and stimulus for the economy immediately? Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. We're working as fast as we can. Uh, obviously, we're here today to pass uh, the necessary legislation in order to provide uh, that boosted income support uh, to those Australians uh, who need it. Um, passage of the legislation is uh, a um, uh, necessary prerequisite and we're doing it as fast as we can um, and you know obviously when you talk about uh, making payments uh, to millions and millions of um, Australians potentially um, there's already 800,000 um, Australians thereabouts who are receiving uh, the new start allowance um, we expect the costing uh, for the uh, increased income support uh, measure for those who lose their job assumes that about a million Australians might well uh, access that additional uh, payment there is a level of practical work involved in making sure that the systems are able to process and, and, and administer these things, but we are working as fast as we can. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government is acting decisively and responsibly to protect Australians from COVID-19? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Smith for that question. Um, Mr. President, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is first and foremost a health crisis, and the government is dealing with the health battle as our highest priority. Our health mission uh, is to slow down the spread of the virus to save lives. We will not be able to stop the spread of the virus, but by slowing it down, we will ensure that our health system has the best possible chance to appropriately prioritise treatment and support for our most vulnerable fellow Australians. Already 1,479 uh, individuals, um, as of 1 p.m. today, have been tested positive to COVID-19, and sadly there have been uh, seven deaths. That is why we have, through the National Cabinet, put in place a series of stage one restrictions on social gatherings. The following facilities have been restricted from opening from today, pubs, registered and licensed clubs, hotels, excluding accommodation, gyms, and indoor sporting venues, cinemas, entertainment venues, casinos and nightclubs, restaurants and cafes uh, being restricted to takeaway and or home delivery, religious gatherings, places of worship or funerals in enclosed spaces and other than very small groups and where the one person per four square meter rule applies. Uh, these enhanced measures build on prior measures including no non-essential gatherings of more than 500 people outside or more than 100 people inside, all non-essential indoor gatherings of less than 100 people must have no more than one person per four square, meter, square meters. Where possible, keep one and a half meters between yourself and others, avoid all non-essential travel and restrictions on entering aged care homes to protect all Australians have of course also been put in place. Mr. President, unfortunately, uh, there will likely be more restrictions to come. Uh, this is a you know, very difficult period. We're only at the beginning. Uh, this will get worse before it gets better, although it will, it will get better. The Federal Government will continue to act on the medical advice as this crisis unfolds. Uh, everything we do will be aimed at protecting uh, the health and the uh, livelihoods of the Australian people. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the Minister inform the Senate what the Morrison Government is doing to support Australian workers at this difficult time? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, today, sadly, we have seen Australians lining up at Centrelink offices across our nation as this crisis deepens. We have put in place an unprecedented safety net to cushion Australians from this crisis. The government is temporarily expanding eligibility to income support payments and establishing a new time-limited coronavirus supplement to be paid at a rate of $550 per fortnight. This will be paid to both existing and new recipients of the job seeker payment, youth allowance job seeker, parenting payment, farm household allowance and special benefit. Uh, the coronavirus supplement will be paid for the next six months. Eligible income support recipients will receive the full amount of the $550 coronavirus supplement on top of their payment each fortnight. 
In addition to the $750 stimulus payment announced on 12 March 2020, the government will provide a further $750 payment to Social Security and Veteran Income Support recipients and eligible concession card holders. The government will uh, also allow individuals in financial Order, stress uh, to access up to $10,000 of their super. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Minister, how is the government supporting businesses to stay in business and keep as many Australian workers in jobs as possible? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The government is providing up to $100,000 to eligible small and medium-sized businesses and not-for-profits, including charities. So the minimum payment is $20,000. These payments will help businesses and not-for-profits uh, cash flow so they can keep operating or go into hibernation while still paying their rent, electricity and other bills and retain staff. This measure will benefit around 690,000 businesses employing around 7.8 million people and around 30,000 not-for-profits, including charities. The government will establish the coronavirus SME guarantee scheme, which will support small and medium enterprises to get access to working capital to help them get uh, through the impact of the coronavirus. Under the scheme, the government will guarantee 50 per cent of new loans issued by eligible lenders to SMEs. The government's support will enhance lenders' willingness and ability to provide credit to SMEs with a scheme able to support $40 billion worth of lending to SMEs. The government is uh, temporarily increasing the threshold at which Order. creditors can Senator issue Senator Cormann. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Today we are witnessing extraordinary scenes right across the country, with an unprecedented number of Australians queuing outside Centrelink offices to get urgently needed assistance, and the MyGov website has melted down due to unplanned demand. When asked on ABC Adelaide this morning whether a man who has lost his job but whose partner earns $70,000 a year would be eligible for assistance, the Finance Minister said, and I quote, if he has lost his job, he will be eligible for the job seeker payment, and also he will get a significantly boosted job seeker payment. We've effectively doubled it. Did the finance minister provide the caller with an accurate answer? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Watt, for your question. Um, and, and rightly, you point out that um, these are quite unprecedented times in the level of demand that we're seeing on our Centrelink or our Services Australia um, services is absolutely unprecedented. I mean, as an example, Senator Watt, this morning in a half an hour period we experienced 25,000 calls when we would normally expect to receive somewhere around 2,000 calls. Um, one of the things that um, I'm delighted you give me the opportunity to say in this place, and, and that is that for people who don't uh, who already are on benefit, they don't need to contact Centrelink. They don't need to call, they don't need to go in, they don't need to go online. They will automatically receive their payments uh, from Centrelink. For those who do uh, have to interface with Centrelink for the first time and they are not an existing client, then they only need to contact Centrelink by phone or go online uh, and to provide their details. They will only be required to have evidence of things like uh, their 100 point check, they can do that over the phone verbally and will not be required in the first instance to provide that direct information. So it is very important that Australians who do require the order. services. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Watt on a point of order. On relevance, uh, Mr. President, I know we've got limited time, but I'd like an answer to my question, which is whether the Finance Minister provided this caller with an accurate answer when he assured you, him that Senator the man Watt. would get the job seeker Thank payment. You. Oh, Senator Cormann on the point of order. On a point of order and to assist the Senate. Firstly, there was no caller, uh, so you're not quite representing the facts. But what I would say is I misheard the number that was mentioned to me and I made a mistake. And so if I can clarify that for you, I'm happy to say that in relation to what is uh, clearly a very complicated set of uh, arrangements when it comes to welfare payments, based on having misheard the number, I did not provide an accurate response, but it was not in response to a call. On, on, given the circumstances of this parliamentary sitting, I'll grant some discretion, to, as I always do, to party leaders. On the point of order, Senator Watt, um, that was the second part of your question. I think the minister can be directly relevant to you, refer to the first part of your question that talked about the workload on the Centrelink staff and the Centrelink call centre and the queues that you mentioned. Uh, and the minister can be directly relevant by also referring to the second part of your question. You reminded the minister of 
part of your answer which Senator Cormann has addressed. I'll ask Senator Rustin if she wishes to continue. Um, thank you very much. In, uh, in relation to the changes that are before the House at the moment, the, the legislation that's in the, in the House of Representatives and will, I assume, come to the Senate this afternoon, uh, there are a number of changes for eligibility which will make it easier for Australians to be able to access support from government if they find themselves uh, without a job. And one of those um, is to waive the waiting period, another one is to waive the liquid assets waiting test, and another one is to waive the assets test. Uh, we are not waiving the income test uh, simply because we are making sure that, that the policies that we are directing into this chamber for the agreement of this place are focused on those Australians that are currently the most vulnerable, those that have no income and their families have no income, and that is what the suite of measures that are going to be brought before this place will be delivering yeah. today. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. It is reported that 88,000 workers in the hospitality industry alone lost their jobs over the past few days. Given the urgency of this situation, with people losing their income and being forced to self-isolate right now, why is there a five-week delay for the coronavirus supplement, and why won't people at least be back paid? Senator Rustin. Look, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Watt. Um, now, this is a particular um, technical piece of legislation that's before us today, so you may not have got right the way through all the details of that legislation. But quite clearly, one of the things that we are seeking to do today is to change the eligibility criteria as it applies to job seeker payment and the other payments that are the payments for which the corona uh, supplement will be applicable to, such that people are able to get broader access to them. As I said, waiving waiting periods, waiving assets tests and the like, so that people, those 88,000 people that you're referring to, Senator Watt, will be, at the passage of this legislation and its royal assent, will be eligible for immediate payment, because there is no longer a one-week waiting period. They'll be eligible for immediate payment. They will also be immediately eligible for the $750 bonus that was uh, announced in the uh, stimulus package a couple of weeks ago. So, immediate order, no. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Again, on relevance, the question was about the delay for the coronavirus supplement, Senator Watt, not with, other forms with respect, of payments. Senator Watt, the minister was being directly relevant. I cannot instruct the minister how to answer it. If the minister is talking about the supplement you referred to in your thing, which I heard that she did refer to, and I was listening carefully, I cannot instruct her how to answer a question. Senator Rustin. Yeah, obviously, I look forward to it. Feathering my answer on your next question. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. I'll give this one a go. Minister, who is eligible for the coronavirus supplement? Can the minister confirm that students will not be eligible, even if they lose their part-time job or have their hours drastically reduced? Who else will miss out from this supplement? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mr President, and thank you, um, Senator Watt. The principal purpose of the corona supplement is to provide assistance to those Australians whose principal uh, reason for being unemployed has come about because they've lost their job. Um, so that means it applies to JobSeeker and all of the payments that have been rolled from Newstart into JobSeeker, uh, including um, sickness benefit, which is one of the most topical ones of recent days. It also applies to um, Youth Allowance Other, which is young people who are currently working and may lose their job. Uh, it also applies to special benefit, to farm household allowance and to parenting payment, both single and double. As I said, the purpose of the package that was announced yesterday was clearly twofold. One was to address those people that, that, that have become unemployed and their principal reason uh, for being on payment is because they have lost their job. And the second reason was to make sure that we were supporting business to remain in business and to remain connected to those employees over the period of this coronavirus crisis so they're ready to go back to work when it's over. Order. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update uh, the Senate on the Morrison government's response to the global challenge presented by the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Molan for the question. Mr President, as of Sunday morning, Australia has now experienced over 1,100 cases of the coronavirus, and sadly, seven people have lost their lives. Globally, we have now seen over 253,000 cases and 11,000 lives have been lost. Our priority as a government is to flatten the curve and reduce the number of cases and delay the onset of cases. 
We've established the National Cabinet, which, on receipt of the expert medical advice, is continuing to coordinate a national response across state and federal governments and across party lines in order to ensure consistency and responsiveness to this threat and the challenges it presents. We have taken further steps to enforce social distancing measures, further travel restrictions to prevent the spread of the disease, and we have 130 fever clinics up and running around the country. We are now running one of the world's leading testing programs with just over 120,000 tests conducted in Australia, one of the highest per capita rates of testing in the world. And encouragingly, of those tests, we are receiving around a 99 per cent negative rate. Less than 1 per cent of people tested for coronavirus are diagnosed with the disease. We are testing more widely than almost every other country, and the breadth and depth of our response has been unmatched anywhere else in the world other than Korea and Singapore. Our early actions have put us well ahead of much of the rest of the world. Our early bans on arrivals from China, the bans on Iran and the early declaration of the coronavirus pandemic potential have afforded us a valuable advantage in protecting Australians. Order. Senator Moll on a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And what decisive and responsible steps is the Morrison government undertaking to ensure Australia has adequate access to the testing it needs to continue to manage the containment of the virus. Senator Cash. Mr President, as the Minister for Health has stated, we are managing a global supply shortage of different pieces of equipment. One of them is testing kits. We have had an additional 97,000 arrive in the past week. Of all the countries in the world, there are very few that have actually conducted more tests than Australia. But to be safe, we're also looking at alternative forms of testing, such as point of care. The first of those new point of care tests has been approved provisionally by the Therapeutic Goods Administration last week. And that will expand the range of testing kits available through general practitioners, fever clinics, emergency departments and other mechanisms. Ultimately, we have to protect our elderly and we have to support them, and we have scaled up and conducted over 36,000 telehealth consultations. Senator Moll, on a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, how should Australians respond to the increasing scalable and sustainable measures that are being implemented to contain the virus? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as the Prime Minister has said, this is a shared national mission. We need to work together to protect the elderly, protect the vulnerable and protect those with lung conditions. We can do this by making sure we are limiting the number of people who contract the virus and taking important steps to delay the spread of the disease so our resources are available to treat those most in need. While social distancing and containment measures may seem extreme, it is crucial to follow them so that we can protect our neighbours, our friends and our family. All of our advice is that this is likely to be for a six-month period. It is a challenge, but if we commit to following the medical advice while continuing to do the small human things that we can, checking in on our neighbours, helping a friend with their shopping, we can succeed in minimising the impact. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Leader of Government representing the Prime Minister. Minister, does the government believe that no one should get left behind during the pandemic? If so, what is the government's plan to immediately double the number of intensive care unit beds, ventilators and other necessary medical equipment, and then further increase those supplies in line with the advice of medical experts? so that Australians can be confident that no one will be left to die unnecessarily during the pandemic. Does the government have such a plan? And if so, what is it? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McKim for that uh, question. Uh, we are absolutely focused on making sure that we protect the health of all Australians and all those who are in Australia. 
Um, we have, of course, um, released a $2.4 billion health package to ensure a world-class health system uh, is as well prepared as it can be uh, in the circumstances and has the resources to fight uh, COVID-19 and protect Australians. Uh, but this is a pretty challenging situation. And that is why we are being so adamant that people need to comply with the restrictions that have been put in place by the National Cabinet. That is why we are so adamant that every single Australian has a civic duty to do the right thing by their fellow Australians and by all here in Australia to help us slow down the spread of the virus. We are not able to stop the spread of this virus, but we have to slow it down so that we can uh, ensure that our health system is in the best possible, least bad position to deal with the pressures that are undoubtedly coming, coming our way. And um, in, relation to, in relation to ventilators, Australians should be assured that our health system is well placed to respond to this pandemic. We have a sufficient number of ventilators in our hospitals at the moment, and the states also have processes to convert existing equipment into ventilators and purchase new ventilators. We're also working to secure further supply and increase domestic production as the virus peaks. Uh, the Australian government is currently working with local manufacturers and medical professionals to understand capacity uh, and support an increase in production of ventilators. And you know, if we need to further boost the $2.4 billion addition allocation that we have already made, we will of course do so. Uh, but I mean, this is an evolving situation. We're working with state and territory governments to uh, ensure that we continue to review all of the data and information and advice in front of us to, make, to continue to make decisions to put us in the Order. best possible Senator position Collins. to respond. Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, President. Minister, students at TAFEs and universities who can no longer get casual work as a result of the pandemic, as well as carers and people on the disability pension, will not be available for the $550 a fortnight COVID-19 supplement. Will you extend the supplement to them so they do not live beneath the poverty line and deal with the very real threat of rental eviction and having essential services cut off? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Firstly, uh, Australia has a residency-based income support system and meeting residency requirement is a fundamental component of our safety net. A special benefit is available to specified temporary visa holders. The classes of temporary visa eligible for special benefit are specified in a legislative instrument and currently include temporary partner visas, temporary humanitarian visas and bridging visas for victims of human order. trafficking. Senator um, the McKim on a point of order. Uh, yes, thank you, President. Relevance. In, uh, I'm trying to assist the minister here. The question was not about visas and, and visa classes. It was actually about students at TAFE and university, uh, carers and people on the disability pension. Um, I, I take um, your point not as a point of order but as a, a reminder to the minister of the Thank question. You. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much. And I confirm that the income support payment categories eligible to receive the coronavirus supplement are job seeker payment um, uh, recipients, and that includes all payments progressively transitioning cool. to job seeker payment, those currently receiving partner allowance, widow allowance, uh, sickness allowance, and wife pension, youth allowance, job seeker, parenting payment, partnered and single, farm household allowance and special benefit recipients, which is what I was talking about earlier. Senator McKim, a final supplementary question. Minister, the government announced $715 million of support for airlines and in the next breath Qantas sacked 20,000 workers. What measures will the government take to ensure businesses that receive financial support will be obliged not to sack workers? not engage in share buybacks to artificially inflate the share price, and will the government take an equity state in corporations that have assistance where appropriate? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, it's not our intention to take an equity stake. Um, in relation to Qantas, it's a, it's a business uh, which uh, employed 30,000 uh, Australians as we went into this crisis, and you're quite right. Uh, they have had to make the difficult decision to stand down 20,000 employees in the context where uh, essentially the international and most of the domestic uh, business uh, has collapsed. Um, and you know, we want Qantas to be a strong and viable uh, uh, airline employing 30,000 Australians on the other side of this crisis. If we, if we forced Qantas to keep uh, 20,000 additional people employed who did not have any work to do, uh, that would um, you know, cost a lot of money and at the end of it we would not be 
uh, certain that Qantas would still be a viable business that would be able to employ 30,000 Australians. So, I mean, we, we did provide uh, fee relief, fee relief uh, to uh, a number of um, uh, airlines, you know, in this, in this industry as part of uh, helping to ensure that those Order. businesses Senator can stay in business. Time for the answers expired. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister confirm how many COVID-19 tests have been conducted for one, residential aged care residents, and two, for aged and home care workers? Of these tests, how many have returned positive results? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I can't give you a specific number of how many aged care workers have been tested or, for that matter, matter how many residents have been tested. But what I can say to you, those that have needed a, a test have received a test. In the context of the number of residents who have tested positive um, in aged care facilities across Australia, uh, Mr. President, I can say that uh, there are, as of today, uh, 10 uh, aged care residents who have tested positive, uh, and there are seven staff members who have tested positive in aged care facilities across Australia. Uh, Mr President, uh, there are four aged care facilities in New South Wales where there has been a positive test of either a staff member or a resident. There is one in Western Australia and there is one in South Australia. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I refer to concerns raised with the Minister that residential aged care and home care workers do not have sufficient access to equipment to protect themselves and those for whom they care against the COVID-19 infection. Can the minister guarantee that all residential aged and home care workers will receive the required protection? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Kitching, for the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, one of the things that this government has done and been very proactive in doing is ensuring that we have access to appropriate quantities of PPE. We know, Mr. President, that there is a global shortage of PPE, um, not least because Wuhan, where, uh, where COVID-19 started, was one of the global centres for production of PPE. But we've been very aggressive in looking to uh, have PPE available. Uh, every circumstance in an aged care facility where there's been uh, a requirement for additional PPE through the national stockpile, that has been provided. Uh, we are managing also uh, PPE, particularly for those who are providing home care, where there has been some concerns uh, uh, raised uh, publicly. Uh, but we are triaging. Order, Senator Colbeck, time for the answers expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What is being done to manage potential workforce shortages and ensure that there will be no interruptions to these critical services and that all older Australians will be properly cared for? Additionally, is the government taking steps to retrain people who have lost their jobs in other industries to address any shortages? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, this, is, this is a very, very important question because ensuring that we have the workforce required to provide care in aged care facilities around this country uh, is, is quite important. We've taken a number of measures. Uh, we announced uh, just last week that we're providing uh, for, um, a supplement uh, an, uh, for aged care workers, a retention supplement for aged care workers across the sector, $800 uh, after tax per quarter for two quarters for um, residential care workers uh, and up to $600 after tax for, per quarter for uh, full-time home care workers uh, and part-time workers will provide a pro rata, receive a pro rata rate on that. We've also, Mr President, extended capacity for those on uh, student visas to work additional hours uh, and we've put a significant amount of money 
cooperatively with Order, the states in the surge workforce. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health. Has the minister gathered data to compare the two different virus management approaches, being mitigation used in Italy, France, and USA and elsewhere, or suppression practiced successfully in Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore? In asking this question, I note that South Korea first let things get out of hand, like Italy, and then through rigorous testing, specific isolation and treatment, the South Koreans quickly brought it under control at minimal cost and with minimal disruption to their economy. Has the minister gathered data to compare the two different virus management approaches being mitigation that has failed and suppression that is proving to be so effective and successful? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Roberts for his question. In relation to the gathering of data itself, I will take that on notice. Uh, but in terms of the Australian government's approach, Senator Roberts, um, I'll reconfirm what the Minister for Finance, the Leader of the Government, has stated. Uh, this is an unprecedented challenge, uh, and it has required an unprecedented <coughs> response. In terms of the Australian government's response, you'd be aware uh, Australia is well placed with a world-class health system. We also have a health system and a health emergency uh, responses that are flexible, they are scalable, and they are able to respond effectively to the evolving situation. Australia has been responding to rapid changes in the epi Myology of COVID-19 and activated and is implementing the Australian Health Sector Emergency Response Plan for Novel Coronavirus, which, as you now know, is known as the COVID-19 Plan. Uh, Australia, uh, because of the response that we have taken, is well placed to respond to ill travellers and those at risk of contracting infection with border isolation, surveillance and contact tracing mechanisms already in place. You'll also be aware that a 24-7 national coronavirus health information line is available uh, for the benefit of Hansard on 1800 020 080. And what this uh, health line actually does is provides health and situation information on the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Senator Roberts, I would also point out, this is very, very important, the Australian government is also aware of COVID-19 disinformation, misinformation and Order. scams Senator tar Cash, targeting Australians. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, if the government adopted rigorous testing combined with strict isolation for people with the virus, and for vulnerable people, then most everyday Australians could return to work with minimal disruption to them or our economy. Has the minister modelled this, and will you consider changing Australia's mitigation strategy that is failing disastrously in Italy and wherever it is used, and instead adopt a rigorous testing and suppression strategy reportedly highly successful in South Korea and elsewhere? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. Um, and Senator Roberts, uh, to confront the threat of coronavirus, the Australian government uh, is ensuring we know who has it and where they are. Australia actually, as the Minister for Health has said often, has one of the highest coronavirus testing rates in the world. I'll just repeat that, one of the highest coronavirus testing rates in the world, with over 135,000 tests they have been completed so far. In terms of the outcome of those tests, for every 100 tests completed, 99 have returned a negative result. I'll say that again. For every 100 tests completed, 99 have returned a negative result. And that is why it is important that testing is only undertaken where the patient meets the national guidelines for testing. Order. Senator Cash. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Minister, a second associated factor, hospital beds. In the 55 years from 1961 to 2015, the number of hospital beds per 1,000 people in Australia fell from 12 to 3.8, a decrease of two-thirds. In Italy, the number fell from 9 to 3.5. 
In South Korea, though, it has risen from less than one to almost 12. Japan increased from nine to 13. What will be the impact of high immigration numbers on coronavirus potential for overwhelming of our hospital system? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Senator Roberts, the Australian government has put in place uh, incredibly strict uh, procedures at the border. Uh, you will actually be aware uh, that we have taken a number of decisions in relation to those who are now able to enter Australia, and in fact, a number of the states themselves, and Queensland being the most recent, have also now put in place uh, very, very strict procedures in relation to who is able to enter the particular state and if they do um, in terms of the self-isolation uh, that they are now required uh, to undertake. Uh, so, Senator Roberts, in answer to your question, um, the Australian government has taken a comprehensive uh, response to the issues that you have raised. Senator Antic. <coughs> Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. What scalable and sustainable measures has the Morrison government put in place to ensure the aged care sector is supported and ensure the safety and wellbeing of our senior Australians who require aged care? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Antic, for your question. Uh, Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the significant work that the sector has done so far in preparing for this quite unprecedented uh, situation. I've appreciated the direct input from too many stakeholders to name individually through forums, webinars and many conversations. Uh, and the resilience of the sector is really showing through and will help get us through this terrible situation. On Friday, the government announced an additional $444.6 million for the aged care sector to ensure the continuity of age care, the aged care workforce. Uh, the funding will be used to provide $234.9 million for a COVID-19 redemption bonus to ensure the continuity of workforce for both residential and home care. Provide $78.3 million in additional funding for residential care to support continuity of workforce supply. 26.9 million to increase the residential and home care uh, viability supplements and the homeless supplement, including increased viability supplements for National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Flexible Aged Care Program provider, providers and multi-purpose services. Deliver $92.2 million in additional support to home care providers and organisations which deliver the Commonwealth Home Support Program, including importantly for services such as Meals on Wheels, uh, and to provide early access to those services. And an additional $12.3 million, Mr President, to support the My Age Care call centre to uh, cater for the anticipated increased demand for those services from older Australians. Mr President, this is on top of the $2.4 billion in the health package we announced includes funding for things like telehealth, home medicine services, respiratory clinics, as well as $101.2 million for surge workforce and infection control training for residential and uh, Order, in, Senator in, in Colbeck. Senator Antic, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please outline what the government is doing to support aged care workers during this serious challenge? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. No, I think Senator Antic for his question. Our $444.6 million announcement on Friday shows our commitment to aged care workers. As part of this announcement, full-time direct care workers in residential care facilities will receive a payment of up to $800 after tax per quarter paid for two quarters. Full-time home care workers will receive payments of up to $600 after tax per quarter paid for two quarters. Part-time direct care workers receive a pro rata uh, payment for the amount of uh, time that uh, is worked. For example, if you work two days a week, you'll receive 40 per cent of the payment. Payments will be made via uh, workers' employers, with the first payment expected in June for the preceding quarter. The second payment will be made in September. 
Uh, we're also supporting specific infection control training right across the sector, and a total of 19,000 aged care workers have undertaken infection Order, control Senator training Colbeck. so far. Senator Anthic, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, what can the community do to support Australians during this time? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. This is a very difficult time for people in aged care and their families. Uh, and one thing that Australians can do is limit their ingress to aged care facilities. It's a really tough message to tell people to limit visiting their loved ones in aged care facilities, but it's everybody's job to keep our senior Australians safe. Uh, the government's made an, announced a number of measures. The following people will not be permitted entry into residential aged care facilities. People who have turned, returned from overseas in the last 14 days, people who have been in contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19 in the last 14 days, people with fever symptoms of acute respiratory infection, example, uh, cough, sore throat, shortness of breath, uh, and from the 1st of May, um, people who have not been vaccinated for influenza. Children uh, under the age of 16 also are asked not to attend aged care facilities. Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. More than 2,700 people were allowed to disembark from the Ruby Princess at Sydney's Circular Quay, despite more than 150 cases of illness being logged on board. Almost 50 people from that ship have tested positive to coronavirus, including six people who subsequently travelled to Western Australia. How was this allowed to occur? Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Australian government banned all cruise ship arrivals from the 16th of March for 30 days. This action reinforced those of industry, which has already moved to scale back their activities. The government is committed to slowing the spread of the virus and will consider taking further action as a response in this space. The New South Wales government has addressed its response to the Ruby Princess. In terms of the Ruby Princess itself, the Ruby Princess cruise originally left Sydney port on 8 March for a planned 13-night journey to New Zealand. This was cut short after the government announced bans on vessels. Because the vessel was already on the water in transit at this time, it was granted an exemption to port in Australia. The decision to allow passengers to disembark was made by New South Wales authorities, who assessed them as low risk. This meant passengers could go home but would need to self-isolate for 14 days. We are aware of media reports that since disembarking, passengers have tested positive for COVID-19, and we understand that New South Wales health authorities are contact tracing passengers. As of 21 March, the ship is at sea off the New South Wales coast near Sydney with crew in isolation on board the vessel. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr President. This morning, the Australia Border Force Commissioner said, and I quote, I've asked my officers, when they are boarding a ship that's coming from international waters, to ask the master a simple question. Has anyone on this vessel got flu-like symptoms? If the answer is yes, nobody will be getting off that vessel. Is this the protocol that the Chief Medical Officer recommended that the Australian Border Force use for cruise ships? And why isn't Australia taking the temperature of all international passengers arriving at airports Order, and Senator cruise Ayers. ship terminals? Senator Cash. Thank you. And in relation to temperature screening, as part of our ongoing strategy of containment and minimising risk to the Australian community, a community as detailed in the COVID-19 plan and on the advice of health experts, we have implemented additional screening of passengers at Australian airports. This has included implementing enhanced health screening and temperature testing arrangements for arrivals from high-risk countries 
and ill travellers based on the advice of health experts. The screening is conducted by officers from the Department of Health order. and Agriculture. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Point of order and direct relevance, and I've been hesitant to draw such point of orders given the nature of what we're discussing today. But Senator Ayres has asked a question with only 18 seconds left. We're trying to determine if the protocol outlined this morning by the Australian Border Force Commissioner is actually what was recommended by the Chief Medical Officer. If the Minister could, in her remaining 18 seconds, provide you, that Senator answer. Senator Keneally, you've reminded the Minister of that part of the question. I do believe when the Minister is talking about the issue of temperature screening, she is being directly relevant. I can't direct her how to answer a question, but I've allowed you to remind her of that part of it. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, I can advise that screening arrangements are in high-risk countries on health advice. But in terms of temperature screening, because Senator Ayres, you did actually raise temperature screening. As the Chief Medical Officer has said, because of the incubation period of COVID-19, many people who Order, are— Senator Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Minister, can you guarantee that this won't happen again? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as you would be aware, Senator Ayres, the Australian government is putting in place procedures based on the advice coming from the chief medical officer. Uh, in relation to what occurred with the Ruby Princess, uh, I'll refer you to the answer that I gave uh, in relation to your primary question. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister outline how the Liberal and Nationals government is working to support the agriculture sector and its work face, workforce to face the challenges posed by COVID-19, and how is it keeping the supply chain moving? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks Senator McKenzie for her question and her very obvious long-standing interest in all things rural and regional Australia. Agriculture and its downstream industries are absolutely essential part of the Australian economy, and they are an essential service. The government recognises the necessity of keeping these industries running efficiently and effectively, but particularly in a time of crisis that we now are facing. Agriculture obviously has linkages right the way through the supply chain, which has flow-on benefits for employment in other industries, but particularly for employment in our rural and regional areas. The food and beverage manufacturing sector is one of the largest manufacturing sectors in Australia and not only plays a critical role in our economy, but it also plays an extraordinarily critical role in the ongoing food security for this country. We obviously um, understand that COVID-19 uh, and potential associated travel uh, restrictions may have an impact on the availability of both domestic and migrant labour to harvest horticultural commodities. And that's why the government is in the process of preparing a number of options to minimise the impact on the supply chain from labour right the way through to the transportation of our primary produce. And we will keep working closely with farmers because we believe the farmers are best placed to inform us about what they need to ensure that solutions are actually going to uh, be designed with the farmers in mind to protect our food chains for all Australians. To that end, we convened the Food and Grocery Sector Group as part of the government's critical infrastructure network to ensure supermarkets and food producers have access to information that they need to ensure that the supply chains remain flowing. Uh, we are also working with states and territories uh, through the national coordination mechanism to make sure that we continue to coordinate critical agriculture and food supply chain issues during this time. I want to reassure all Australians that despite the current outbreak of COVID-19, we have more than enough food to feed ourselves. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. What is the government doing to ensure export opportunities remain open for our primary producers? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. And as Senator McKenzie would, would be uh, well aware, um, Australia produces significantly more food than we actually consume in this country. In fact, last year around 70 per cent of our agriculture was exported. So to that end, we have plenty of food for Australians. But it's also very important that we keep farm businesses in, uh, in business and give them the opportunity to continue to be able to sell their goods uh, and into other markets where it is possible. Uh, because this ensures that these businesses continue to turn a profit 
continue to operate efficiently and, importantly, help them to retain staff, which is so important to keep money flowing through local economies. So we will continue to closely uh, monitor the impact of COVID-19 on our exporters, uh, working together with our trading partners through the work of Senator Birmingham as the Minister for Trade. We understand travel restrictions have the potential to impact on new and existing marketplaces, and we will be working diligently to make sure that we do everything that we can do to mitigate against that Order. impact. Senator Rustin. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. What scalable and sustainable measures is the government putting in place to continue to support agriculture through this challenging time? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, the government has a range of programs to support agriculture because we recognise that agriculture is one of the most fundamental essential services in Australia at this time. For instance, the Farm Household Allowance, which gives farming families the assistance that they need through these tough times just to get food on the table, received a boost this morning, and I thank all of those opposite, for supporting the uh, final set of amendments to that particular bill to assist our farmers who aren't just doing it tough because of the coronavirus but are also doing it tough because of the drought that they have been in for a quite sustained period of time and those others that have been impacted by bushfire. Uh, we've also invested more into rural financial counselling services so farmers can access the timely advice that they need when they need it. We are also very conscious of the mental health of our farmers and our farming communities, and we want to make sure through our mental health measures that we are supporting our farmers. So we have boosted that as well as boosting concessional loans and taking generous taxation measures to support our farming communities. Order. Senator Rustin. Senator Gallag <coughs> Gallagher? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, we did swap the order, um, Senator which Gallagher. we did tell most people. Um, <laughs> that's my fault as manager as well, so it's a very public— Extraordinary yeah, time. Penny will be tuning into that. Um, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister inform the Senate how many Australians the Morrison government anticipates will meet the ABS definition of unemployment? as a result of COVID-19. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much. and I thank the Senator for the question. And, uh, Mr President, the labour force figures actually recently came out last Thursday. Um, it was pleasing to see that Australia currently has a record number of Australians in employment, in excess now of 13 million. Um, we also have a record number of Australians in full-time employment. But the point that I made at the press conference that I gave was the February figures do not represent the impact of COVID-19. Uh, as the Prime Minister has said, as the Treasurer has said, as the Minister for Finance has said, uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Australians are going to either be stood down or be out of work as a result of the impact of COVID-19. Uh, that is why the government has put in place a process which the Prime Minister, when we announced our first stimulus package, stated. It was squarely focused on keeping Australian businesses in business and keeping Australians in work. We recently announced a second package that was squarely designed at cushioning the blow. Uh, Mr President, the government is moving rapidly to provide assistance that supports businesses to survive this disruption and rebuild once the virus has passed. Uh, but as I said, um, Australians are going to lose their jobs. We are aware of that, very aware of that, in particular given what occurred this morning with the shutdowns in some of the states. Uh, we are doing everything that we can to keep businesses in business, Australians in jobs and to cushion the blow for those who find themselves are unable to work. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr President. When does the government expect unemployment as a result of COVID-19 to peak? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, Treasury is modelling a number of scenarios at this point in time. Uh, the impact uh, on unemployment 
is not going to be known um, for some time because we do not yet know the impact that COVID-19 uh, is having on the economy. Uh, but again, the government is very, very aware of the challenges that the labour market now faces as a result of COVID-19, and that is why we have now announced in excess, I believe, of $187 billion uh, in support to get Australians, uh, whether they're a business, whether they're an employee, whether they're an employer, uh, to the other side of this crisis uh, and then back into business and back to work. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the government ensure vital skills and connections to the workforce are not lost for those who experience unemployment as a result of COVID-19? Senator Cash. You raise a very, very good point, and that is exactly uh, what the Prime Minister talked about yesterday, in particular in relation to uh, the impact uh, on, for example, sole traders. Uh, there are many sole traders whose businesses uh, are going to have a significant financial impact because of COVID-19. Um, I've been working very, very closely with Minister Rustin uh, to ensure that they are able to get access to uh, or they're eligible for um, the COVID-19 supplement. But the key here is what we've done with mutual obligation. Um, we are going to allow them to continue to work in their business, and they will actually, by doing that, discharge their mutual obligation. Um, connectivity with the workforce is one of the most important things that we can do, not just to as a government, but certainly uh, businesses out there, because we do want Australians to maintain any form of connectivity that they can. So when we come Order. to the other Senator side of this Cash. crisis, time has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash, um, and I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper, and I also move that the sitting of the Senate be uh, suspended till the ringing of the bells. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The sitting of the Senate is suspended until the ringing of the bells.